Talking financial organization and a professional practice does not have to be boring. Are you ready for a few money in, money out ideas? It's Susan Gunn coming directly to your head to make you think. Can you handle the truth? Because she is known for being energetic, laughs a lot, and gives honest, sometimes direct, but always practical advice. It's time now for Money In, Money Out. Over the past 25 years, I've been working with professional practices. I have most certainly seen some messes. Oh my goodness. I have really seen some messes. Nothing that couldn't be straightened out. Nothing that couldn't be fixed. But keep in mind, I'm not a CPA. I am a financial organization expert that helps practices design and organize their two accounting systems to better understand their money in and their money out. There are two accounting systems, the practice management software and QuickBooks or your CPA, depending on what you're using. There is not one accounting software for professional practices like there is in other industries. There are two. So when I hear my accounting software is in a mess, I ask, which one? I've been talking QuickBooks, writing about QuickBooks, involved with QuickBooks since QuickBooks 1.0. It's been a long time. Written books about it, a long time. I know that software, but it only does accounts payable. I typically do not see QuickBooks files from practices that have an awesome CPA, unless it just needs a little tweaking for back-to-back -back accountability between the QuickBooks and the practice management software. This year, though, I have been utterly disappointed in what I have witnessed in CP CPA involved in accounting. Apparently, I can't even say it. CPA involved accounting. I wrote about it in my newsletter recently, and I just wanted to take the time to talk about it in a podcast because I've gotten a few questions. This year, I have seen four of the worst QuickBooks files I've ever seen. Again, Nothing that couldn't be fixed, and I only saw them because they ordered an extreme makeover. But oh my gosh, and they were all in the worst shape ever because communication and expectations were not discussed with the CPA. There was no scope of letter, scope of work letter. So here to help discuss this timely topic are my two colleagues, Linda Valencia, and Jody Catlinello from Mosaic Management. I invited them to join me because they know what the practice needs to see from their various financial statements. Hey, you two, welcome back to the table. Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan, thank you. So um, we, we're friends too, and so we've been chatting a while about some of the things we just wanted to make sure that we went through. But I wanted to, for the audience, I think we should explain a little bit more in depth the accounting system as a whole for professional practices. Accounts receivable is the practice software. That's where all in dentistry, that's where all of the charts are kept, all the treatment planning, all the insurance, all the insurance payments, credit card payments, the patient payments, everything accounts receivable is done in the practice management software. QuickBooks is only the accounts payable. The accounts receivable is about 85% of the work. Accounts payable is about 15% of the work. If you add a third entity for payroll, that's another set of reports. If you process payroll through QuickBooks, then it is all contained inside QuickBooks. And QuickBooks has an assisted payroll option where Intuit files all the taxes and payments on your behalf, just like ADP and paychecks, but inside QuickBooks itself. So no further work or entry is required. It's automatic, it's in there. So Jody and Linda, what are the pros and cons of a practice doing their accounts payable in QuickBooks? What do you see from a business consultant standpoint? 
This is Jody, and I'll speak first. I think that the thing that we see when people do take the time to pay their own bills, and I guess I will say that for our clients, there are some clients that do have a bookkeeper that does pay their bills, but I would say a good 80% or more, they are the doctor themselves is the one that is looking at the expenses, signing the checks, and paying the practice bills, whether it's their credit card statement or whatever else. Um, so what I think the benefit is to the doctor is that they have their fingers then on what the expenses are in the practice. And they should have a good understanding of what a typical month's expenses are, whether that's for dental supplies, their lab, their facility costs, but they should have some understanding of what their expenses are. People that are completely hands off and don't take the time to review their profit and loss statement with someone like Linda and I, or um, even with their CPA firm, they typically are blind to what they're spending and where they are, where they stand in the practice and can be blindsided by expenses and costs. Right. And so especially important with this last year, with the whole pandemic and practices being shut down across the country, it's been really great for them to actually know um, um, expenses right on and historical information. That's the other great thing. To know historical information is amazing. I think the other thing when you're trusting someone else to do your accounts payable for you. As Jody mentioned, you need to make sure you have a way to keep your fingers on what is being categorized, what is being spent. And so whether that's you breaking down the credit card bill for the person who's doing your bookkeeping, whether that's, um, you know, having a method to meet to review together. If you're not going to do it as the doctor business owner personally, at least not long term, you may do that initially to learn the different categories and what should and should not be spent in those areas as far as percentages to collections and that sort of thing. Um, but hopefully if you're going to be delegating that to some sort of bookkeeper, whether that's a team member in house or whether that's somebody through an accounting firm that you still need to be able to look to see how they are breaking, splitting, and categorizing things because oftentimes they don't have the information that's appropriate. Yeah, and I always tell them, you know, if they're doing their QuickBooks, it takes about two hours a week. With the ability to download transactions into the bank accounts and to download uh, uh, transactions into the credit card accounts into QuickBooks, it's so much easier. And especially if they're doing payroll from QuickBooks, then two hours a week. I mean, seriously, two hours a week. Now, we've we've had some recent experiences that the banks are not always um, do what they say they can do. Um, but if you've got a bank that can download uh, the QuickBooks, that's the best and will save you so much time from manually entering. I also, if, if, Clients, if practices have a grip on their expenses and they are not overspending, I also recommend that they put everything on the credit card as much as possible because that's much easier to download and much easier to pay than it is to write checks. In fact, I discourage writing checks. Yes. And if the, the bank has bill pay, that it's much easier to do the bill pay through the bank than it is to write a check. That is so important, Susan. I mean, just the whole check writing thing um, is, it just leads to embezzlement. I mean, you know, that's another side to um, you is you're doing fraud examination, but checks and check stamps and all that stuff, they're just, they're just ripe for somebody to take advantage of. And that's not something you need to be focused on um, or in your, yeah. yeah. No, I recently had a CPA firm that had a signature stamp. <laughs> that's, um, 
<laughs> so just to let you know, I have had CPA firms that have embezzled, bookkeepers embezzled, and it does happen. I mean, it's it kind of is a bad, I mean, just like we've had consultants that have embezzled. For sure. You know, so. Yeah. Um, well, and I think that for the doctors, you know, that's why that totally hands off management style gets them in trouble. Yeah. Uh, you know, we want to teach them how to delegate, but not abdicate. Abdicate. Not totally take their eye off the ball. They have to know what the norm is for their practice, for their area, and they have to know what's reasonable. They have to be able to authorize certain payments and at a certain threshold that's going to be over and above a, you know, a, a percentage that it should be at against their collections. They need to be able to say, I need to be able to authorize this before it goes through when they are able to delegate. Um, so I think that's the hard part. It's when a dentist doesn't understand this accounting side very well, it's easy to pay someone else and trust someone else, um, you know, yeah. blindly. And um, well, it's not that hard if we can teach them what to look for and have some standards. It, it isn't time consuming and it shouldn't be frightening. No. And, and here's here's the evolution of that. Just to give a brief overview, because since I've been working with using QuickBooks in businesses since it was QuickBooks 1.0, I've seen the evolution in the dental industry. And what happened was in the very beginning, they were saying, oh, they're dentist. They could never do this accounting. They can't do this. They'll screw it up. They'll make a mess of it. And so they spent their time. And I think mostly because they were afraid of losing their own jobs um, in the CPA or with accounting, that this software would take over their jobs. And that was never going to happen because we all need, still need the CPAs to know tax code. Good grief. That's something that, especially this last couple of years, has just become so vitally important. But I kept saying, oh, why, why do they say that? Because, again, the QuickBooks part of it's 15% of the total accounting package. The practice software is where a majority of everything happens. And yet this small little 15%, they were throwing out to the CP, to the dentist that they couldn't do it, that they were completely inept. And that's not true. That's a lie. And it is so, I mean, we manage our own money personally, right? So what's the difference? We're just doing it in a software and organizing I it. I just think that there's also, there's a piece here that, you know, accountants are very detail-oriented. Typically, dentists are very detail-oriented. Both want to do things accurately, at least the majority of them. They want to do things accurately. They want to do things well. And when we change something, it feels hard. Um, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. It doesn't mean right. it can't be done. It doesn't mean you don't have the skill set to be able to do it. You might just need some hand-holding to get through it. But, I mean, like we've said, I, this should not be an overwhelming burden to any practice owner once it gets set up. Well, and that's, quite frankly, when all of that was going on historically, I started really being vocal about you know, the dentists are not uh, CPAs, so we should not force them to use accounting numbers. The dentists are not CPAs, so we shouldn't have to have N slash P or A slash P or any of these other accounting acronyms in their accounting file. Because when you put those on a report and you hand it to the dentist, the dentist looks at that first set of numbers and go, okay, is that supposed to be important? because I don't know what the end says, you know? And so there's two sets of numbers. And so if you are a CPA and you're listening to that, stop giving reports to your clients that have accounting numbers on it. They don't know what that means. And they think they should. And so the more that you have those on there, they think they can't do anything. And so you're really not having a client-focused practice. It's more about what you want to do. And what you want. You've got to think about the practices 
in how to best help them manage their money. So I want to take us back to, we were talking about breaking down credit card bills earlier. And one thing I know that Jody and I have recommended at times is to have more than one business credit card to keep it more like one for dental lab, say, and one for the dental supply company, just to help with the breakdown if that is necessary. And for sometimes some of those can get pretty high if it's a high producing practice and you hit limits very easily. Is there, do you have any thoughts on that, Susan? Is that of good, course bad? So. Or wait, wait, you're <laughs> asking if I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, do, yeah. Are, do we, do we need to not recommend that or is that a good strategy? <laughs> No, I think that's great. I mean, you know, if they want to do it with two, then they could certainly do it, but they're downloading. And so I recommend to download at least every two weeks, the credit card charges into QuickBooks. And once they have that categorized, they can actually just set up an auto pay with their bank or with the credit card itself to auto pay a lump sum because they'll know what their average um, dental expenses are going to be. Yeah. And so once you look at a historical, maybe take three months, figure out the historical, they'll be able to figure out what historically, what their bill averages to be. And so they could pay every $3,000 every two weeks, you know, just to say, and then when the statement comes in, so they put towards 6,000, put in the remaining. What's cool is because it's in the own credit card register, and you're downloading the transactions, you know at, at every moment what the balance on the credit card is. So they're all categorized. You know, I, the only time that I might recommend that is when it was, um, when they have really high and they don't have enough limits to cover that, um, then that makes sense. I never recommend, by the way, using a debit card. Um, never, never been that way for a long time. FBI doesn't recommend it. I'm not, don't recommend putting um, auto pays on any debit card. It's attached to your business account. And so don't want anything attached to the business account. So um, as business consultants, you've kind of touched on this just a little bit. What's the most important thing do you feel like for practice to, to understand about their financial statements? What do you want them? Okay, so I guess I'll jump in. Um, I want them to understand it's not just one thing. There's a number of categories that are important. The largest expense in a dental practice is the employee expense. And having a handle on what your employee expense is um, against your revenue as well as against your production especially for those of you that are um, in reduced fee plans, you have adjusted production and then your revenue gets collected from your adjusted production. But in order to get to that adjusted production number, you have to produce at a much higher level. So you're staffing to produce at that higher level. And there are definite things from a consulting standpoint that we want to look at from practice management in understanding that. So that's very different than tax management, right? Which is what I want your CPA to be doing for you. I need the figures broken out. The CPA may not care about the administrative staff salary level, the assisting staff salary level, and the hygiene staff salary level. That frequently is something that Linda and I will request from a CPA is that they split it out for us because there's a balance from a management standpoint about how many administrative people you need on staff for your productivity. Same with assistance. And there are definitely figures that we run in regards to hygiene. Well, and that's why the assisted payroll solution inside of QuickBooks can be so valuable because you can set up the payroll items for an assistant, for a hygiene, for front desk, for the officer, uh, the doctor. And so when yeah. you, yeah, when you pay them, it goes directly to that account in the chart of accounts so that when you run the report, you can run the report 
based on percentages of income so that you can get those percentages. So you know what percentage of income the assistant cost, the hygiene, the front desk. Mm -hmm. And so it makes your job a lot easier. Um, but, but if you don't do it inside of QuickBooks, you have to manually key in everything to be able to get that. And usually when you download from another payroll entity, you're just putting three numbers in the total cost of the payroll, the total cost of the taxes and the payroll service fee. And that's it. So that's the beauty of having the QuickBooks payroll inside of QuickBooks. Right. You can easily get to the breakdowns and make the management decisions. You need yeah. To make from yeah. Yeah. And to tag on what Jody said, too, there is a huge difference between between a tax accounting style chart of accounts and a practice management uh, chart of accounts. And I, I say this all the time and um, in and Linda and Jody will appreciate this. I was frustrated in 2004 at all the charts of accounts that I saw that were used in dentistry and very long story short, ended up going to a class by our, our dear mutual friends, uh, Debbie and Virginia, Debbie Castagna and Virginia Moore. They were speaking in uh, Las Vegas at the time to hear what information that the consultants needed to hear. And so from that information, I took that and went, okay, I threw out all the chart of accounts that I found because none of them were designed the way they needed to be to manage. And that's when I started saying the practice management chart of accounts really is what needs to be put into place. No accounting numbers, no uh, lingo, accounting lingo, but to make it for you. And I've actually had CPAs that have called and said, this is awesome. This is, this is really good. I've had a couple of them that didn't like, um, you know, they didn't like the loss of control. I think is really how you could say that. Um, but when you do a business management style chart of accounts, instead of tax accounting, you can always do the taxes. They but can if you translate just, over easily. Yeah. Absolutely. They, yeah, it, there's not a problem. No, with but that. you can do, but if you take the tax style accounting, it's really hard to get the numbers that you guys need. Right. So, what Linda and I will with newer clients to us, it takes us a long time sometimes to take somebody's PL where an accountant has grouped things together because it's better from a tax standpoint. And we have to get into the general ledger and split things back out so we understand what the practice is actually spending on, for example, their facility or what their total equipment costs are, um, you know, or breaking out the payroll uh, so that it's not just clinical and administrative. Lumping the assistants in with the hygienists, which doesn't allow Linda and I to even know whether the hygienists are making any money for the practice or not. So there's a lot that goes into um, the P&L. And the, when you have it set up from a management standpoint, it's really helpful to a doctor to get a grasp of where they're spending where they are at um, in regards to things, because the tax stuff, that's what your CPA is for. They are supposed to pull things together so to put you in the best position possible. Not put you in jail, <laughs> but to make you appropriately play, pay taxes um, for what you are doing. So, so let's, I just think there's a difference. So what would a dream CPA look like for your clients? Oh, I, I and Linda and I have several clients that do have excellent mm -hmm. CPAs. Yes. They really do. So the dream CPA understands how to purchase equipment for the practice so that they get the most tax benefit from it. They will also give advice in terms of consolidation of loans and how to manage the debt in the practice so they get the best tax benefit from that. 
Um, because there's something besides that too little debt and too much debt, too you know, much we got to find the right balance, right? Right, and I just I think that the other things that come up for questions that people have oh, can I hire this person? How much should I pay them? What is, um, you know, do I have enough to be able to, should I be thinking about building a new facility, for example? I mean, those are big, momentous decisions, and we can help them navigate those kinds of decisions, but you need a good accountant on your side who's going to know how to manage the expenses so that you get the best tax benefit um, for those expenses, because, you know, we all know dentistry is an expensive business to be in. A dentist is, owns large pieces of equipment that cost them a lot of money. And you have to write those off properly. Otherwise, what are you doing? I mean, right. you, you're just taking money out of your pocket. Right, which we've seen a lot of them do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have, unfortunately. Yeah, the other thing that I would add is, because we were joking about this uh, before we started recording, I don't, I I see one or two really good CPAs, <laughs> in, and I don't really typically see good CPAs. I mean, I'll see a good CPA if they just need a few things tweaked, right. um, but I don't usually see good CPAs. Well, we don't have to refer our clients. Right. We don't we refer do people you to you. Do you do you get all the bad ones. I do get all the bad ones. So. Susan loves us. <laughs> it's been a year. Uh -huh. It has been. But, it has been. but what I want in a CPA is I want them to be client focused, not about them. I want them to pay attention to what, the practice really needs and they don't need to be controlled. I mean, um, I've recently read emails from a CPA firm that were demeaning language, hateful language to the doctor owner, disrespectful. I mean, I couldn't believe it. It was amazing. And so to read that kind of stuff, you just wonder, what the heck? Um, anyways, but to be client-focused, we are. We have to be. And I wouldn't expect anything less from a CPA firm. I Also, just helping them manage their business, not take control of managing their business, but managing, help them manage their business getting the resources that they need at the right time. And if that means that they're in a quandary and they need a bookkeeper, an occasional bookkeeper or whatever, then they can pitch in and help. Um, but not the control thing. I don't, sometimes is an issue um, with, and again, it goes back to what Jody said about being so detailed oriented um, that there's a control freak factor to some degree sometimes. So I'm trying to be really nice because again, I see the bad ones. Linda hasn't given me the sign yet. So <laughs> I must one be doing things, okay. Yeah, you're okay. You're saying it nicely. <laughs> um, one of the things that can be a, a trigger for Jody and I, when we're looking at the expenses in a, a dental practice is an extremely high accounting expense. And then so that it could be, I mean, there may be good reason for it. And that's the questions we have to ask. But if it's if it's the type of monthly reporting that's coming from the accounting firm that is just, you know, thrown into a drawer and the doctor thrown into a file on the computer, however, they're looking at it where, where the dentist isn't even reading these or looking at them, but they're paying a lot of money for them. So I think we try to get it to the point where we get things set up. So there's a managed report that means something to them and then how much of the tax reporting sort of um, reports that they get on a quarterly or a twice a year or whatever it takes for them to plan appropriately for their tax liability. Okay. So we have to talk about something which we've encountered recently um, in that, 
um, the CPA firm was keeping a um, another software. They were they were using their own proprietary software to track um, the financial statements for the practice and not doing it uh, in the QuickBooks that the client had. Um, I wrote about this in the newsletter. And so if, if you have read the newsletter, then you know what I'm talking about. But two of the, two of the practices were on QuickBooks Online and thought that was their accounting and their financial reports that they were reviewing. And it was not. That information was only being used as a glorified checkbook. And they went online to get that information and to put it in the CPA's proprietary software. And so if, if you are using a product and your CPA is not entering adjustments or putting in depreciation or amortization into your QuickBooks file, then you need to ask, is this the software that you're using for my taxes? and make sure that there's not another proprietary software. I'm not a fan of that. I know that some people do that really well, but I've seen most cases it's not been done really well. Somebody's accounting software doesn't have the complete information and the other one has the complete information. It's typically not the doctor that has the complete information. And so that's a real problem. And I just, I was like, the one that it happened to, I said, why in the world do you recommend that a practice spend $75 a month for QuickBooks Online just for transactions? And they weren't downloading either. It's in both CPA firms had no idea about downloading or doing it, doing it that way and then ask. You know, I mean, T-Sheets, I mean, Google Sheets is so much cheaper. <laughs> it could put the transactions <laughs> and everything in there instead of paying $75 a month for something that's not being used for, for accounting. Mm -hmm. That's, I couldn't believe that. Right. Well, and, and how does a dentist even know that that's happening, how, to even ask that? And, and in this case, it was we were asking for certain information for us to help them make the right decisions and for us to put together the reporting we needed, and they couldn't get to it. And they were always so frustrated with these numbers don't make sense, or I'd get the numbers and I'd be like, something would be off with it. And so it took kind of enough of that sort of conversation happening month after month to realize then we needed to ask these different types of questions. What's going on here? Yeah, and and only one of the files because you guys referred both of the clients to me for the extreme makeover, which I go <laughs> go in. I have to I have to clarify this. Go in and I redesign the chart of accounts to be what we've talked about. I create reports that they can review on a weekly and a monthly basis. And it, it's intense. It takes a lot of time, but oh my gosh, the finished product is amazing. In fact, just as, as an aside, not one of your clients, but uh, another one that I did an extreme makeover for was giggling like a four-year-old when she saw, I'm serious. It was hysterical. I wanted to record it. I've never had a dentist giggle and get so excited about seeing the reports and seeing the change and understanding their financial reports. And she was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is amazing. I mean, she was so excited, but yeah. But, you know, that's such a fear that dentists have, you know, when it's it's a big black hole when they don't understand it, when it's just some report that they get from their CPA and it doesn't match anything in their reality. They continually have that gut feeling that the bottom's going to drop out. The anxiety and is off the charts. And, you know, that's really what we are trying to do through this process of creating a management tool is to allow our clients to feel like they have control again um, and that they understand it. Well, if there was ever a time, it was this last year, mm -hmm. you know, and so many of them had no idea about their finances mm -hmm. and especially the ones where the CPAs were paying the 
the bills. Um, when they took over everything and you're getting delayed reports two or three months down the road during 2020, that was completely inappropriate. They needed those reports sooner than later so that they could make decisions. Right. And historical reports this year compared to last year. Okay. And the ones that weren't doing in QuickBooks, most of the time they just didn't get it. And so that's the, the, this sounds like a sales job in QuickBooks, but you know what? It's not freaking rocket science. These people went to dental school. It's way more difficult than QuickBooks. And they already know. I mean, I will tell you the practice management software is way more difficult than QuickBooks. Yep. Well, I think there's just such relief for the, the practice owner, for the dentist, to be able to understand their numbers both the accounting side and the practice management productivity side, because that allows them to make decisions that don't require getting emotionally involved. They can make logical decisions and feel confident with it um, and not lose sleep over it. And, and so that's, you know, when you talk about your client who is giddy when she saw her reports and, and things like that, when we can teach them how to get clean information and trust the information and know what is reasonable in that category to be spending or not spending. It helps them not get, you know, distracted by either employees wanting more money or the sexy new equipment they want to purchase and, you know, what it really means to their bottom line or to their tax <laughs> situation. So. Yeah. Instead of just calling the bank and finding out what their balance is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's so, um, one of the things that uh, has amazed me, too, with the four problem cases I've had this year. Um, and there's been more, but I these four cases have been the worst ones I've seen in a long time. But with the four, none of them had a scope of work or an engagement letter with the CPA. And so when both of those that were on QuickBooks Online said, hey, you know, we thought we were getting our accurate financial information. We thought everything was up to date. There was that miscommunication, that lack of clear expectation um, between the client and the CPA. And there was no surprise, surprise scope of work or engagement letter that stated exactly what they would be doing and not doing. I mean, when clients work with us, we have engagement letters, right? Yep. Absolutely. So, so that's all we're going to say about that, apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, how do you spot check your CPA? How do you guys do it? Well, I guess, you know, I mean, we're, like some of the things we've been talking about, the things we're looking at that seem out of, you know, either either out of whack to us. It's not what we see in a lot of the other, you know, if things are not normal compared to what other clients that we've looked at are, um, that's when we start asking questions or having them uh, consider looking into you know, a, another firm that might have more experience with dental practices and know the the ins and outs of the, the, the industry. So I think. Yeah, that's certainly one way we have doctors that complain about mm -hmm. the level of taxes that they are, paying. that they are paying. Um, we also will, um, if the doctor is not filling, filling out a separate management tool for us, because some of our clients, you know, they have their P&L that is tax focused. And then we have them, if they're not changing that, then they have to do a management document for us in regards to their expenses. So that adds some time, right? Um, however, with that, you can typically see because if their books aren't set up well, they can't get the numbers into the management tool for us very easily. So um, that's a good spot check for us. And that is something that for the majority of our clients, we review expenses on a, on a monthly basis 
minimally on a quarterly basis, Mm -hmm. because that is definitely something that is important. So whether we're doing that via P&L and you look at the P&L and maybe you look at the general ledger too, and you can sometimes see some pretty screwy stuff. (laughs) Steve's landscaping under dental supplies, dental equipment, and as Mm -hmm. a facility expense. I mean, Steve's landscaping by the name, I'm going to assume that's landscaping (laughs) and that should be a facility expense, not a dental supply and certainly not a piece of equipment that you are purchasing. So yeah, um, it's it's yeah. been amazing this year just with the four really bad ones and all CPA controlled, by the way. Um, the the level of transactions that were put into wrong accounts, um, because I go through uh, the prior because I'm a I'm big fan of previous year history. And so I go through the whole prior year up to the date of the current year and move the transactions and review them all to make sure they're in the appropriate accounts. Um, And so just making sure, I mean, I know dentistry, so it's pretty easy to be able to do that. Um, But it's amazing, just like what you said, Jody, how many um, various transactions I see in multiple accounts, same vendor, same amount even, but in three or four different accounts or multiple accounts that are the same thing. That's the other thing I see. And that just tells me that they have all these different accounts that don't aren't meaningful to them. So they don't know that Steve's landscaping goes into facility maintenance. You know, they don't have a single facility maintenance category. Right. And Steve's landscaping always goes there. And that can be a, you know, it if you ty- start to type in Steve's landscaping in QuickBooks, facility maintenance will come up if you consistently put it into facility maintenance. Right. Well, in fact, it's kind of it kind of goes back to what we were saying about when I was talking about the the control factor, um, it is the dentist, the dentist owners is the boss of the practice, not the CPA. It is the dentist owner that needs to set the precedent and say, this is what I need from you. If that can't be done, then the dentist owner needs to find a new CPA that understands dentistry, but I'll tell you, the dental CPAs are slammed right now, trying to figure out the prior year. And if the practice is in rural America, it's really hard to find a dental specific CPA to handle that account. And and we've tried um, to handle them from a let them use their own accounting software. Don't force them to use your proprietary software uh, standpoint. Don't try to sell them things that they don't need. Just work with them from a tax standpoint and help them with their accounts payable part of their whole accounting system. And so um, one of the things that they are using proprietary software, I want to make sure I said this, if they are, they are using proprietary software and the doctor is not using the QuickBooks, that's fine. But make sure that you get your timely reports um, on time so you can make accurate decisions based on accurate information. And then the second thing I would say is if you are using QuickBooks and they are using a proprietary software, Make sure that you get still timely reports and compare it with what you have in your QuickBooks and make sure it's the same numbers and that you're not off. And if you are off, ask questions and make sure that your books match. So, I mean, absolutely. And I think, you know, like you said, it's hard to find a good CPA right now that understands the nuances of dentistry, especially with the, you know, the the pandemic ramifications in the past, you know, and all the different tax ramifications that are happening there. How do you keep up with it? So I think it is important to know 
um, who your accountant is and, and where they're getting their information and how they are advising you. Right. I mean, I, I seriously surprised at the number of um, books that I see, QuickBooks and otherwise, where they're not taking advantage of being able to download. That's surprising to me. Such an, especially in light of all the EFT insurance payments. Oh my gosh, if they're signed up with Delta or MetLife or all these other EFT insurance you know, downloading it from the bank is so much easier than manually entering. And yet I still see CPA firms that are manually entering all those numbers. No, I don't, I don't get it. There's such opportunity for error too, when you manually exactly. enter versus downloading. I mean, it's just a, I don't know. Well, I wouldn't want that. No, but at least they would find it when they reconciled every month, hopefully. Hopefully. Well, so what else can we say? Let's talk about your good CPAs. Y'all will have to do that. I do know some good CPAs. Kate Williford is a friend of mine, and I will tell you, I trust her imminently. She's amazing. And um, she I trust her, her knowledge and her passion for the industry and taking care of her clients. And she is slammed and not taking a new clients now. So don't call her. <laughs> but anyways, there's a reason for that. She's, right. she's really good. Well, and, and it's because she cares about her clients. Yeah. She makes sure she and anybody who works with her and for her, and this would be all the other great CPA um, firms that work with dentists, they, they train their people. They know how the changes are impacting dentistry. They, they become a resource for the dentist in how to really uh, navigate all the, the things that have been happening in the last few years around, um, you know, after the pandemic, the COVID-19, the PPE, the, you know, the loans and all the other things. So, um, I, I think that's it, that you can trust that the people you're working with are are more knowledgeable than you are around these things. Uh, and they understand the difference between a management report and a tax report or management accounting and tax accounting. And, and they're willing to, you know, do the analysis of both or give you the information to do that. Yeah. I really feel like, the other thing is you should feel like you're getting customized advice from your accountant. They should understand your practice, your situation, because there are nuances. Yeah. You're not just uh, same as the guy down the street. And so I think it's really important to feel like your accountant knows you, knows your goals for your practice, understands your vision for your practice, what you're trying to build, where you're trying to go, and can provide you with the best tax advice to keep you on that path. And I think, you know, like anything in dentistry, you need to surround yourself with people that have a network of resources to be able to support you in achieving the goals you have for your practice. They shouldn't be telling you what your goals are as a dentist, you have goals for your business and it's up to your resource network to be able to help support you. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what the accounting firm is not an expert at, they know other people who are experts at that and can connect you. Right. I mean, we do the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what um, I don't do what you do. I don't do what a CPA does. I, I just want to organize their financial information um, so that they understand it and that they can go forward and work better with their CPA long term. Um, and so, but I can refer, I've got resources, you know, I, that's what I want to do. Um, I try to stay in my lane, you know, and, and, <coughs> I also try to develop a QuickBooks that they will know if 
the numbers aren't matching the practice software. I, I create a back to back accountability between the practice software and their QuickBooks. Mm -hmm. um, so that when they run a report in their practice software and I teach them how to do it, um, then they can compare it with what they have in their QuickBooks. Um, and see, I mean, if someone is uh, stealing from them, um, then I want to be able to show them and that I have a service for that too. It's called Ask the Expert. We actually dive into their practice software, make sure their payment types are set up right so that it goes to the bank right and it's easy to see on the deposit report. And then it's the accounts are set up correctly so that they can do a report. And that's that back to back accountability. And so lots of them, you guys, I know you run across this. When I do and ask the expert, they're like, I've never seen an audit trail report. I don't know what it looks like. And so I'm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. That's a. And how about who has the security clearance to get that audit trail report? Oh, yeah. In an office. That's another. That's a whole thing. Oh, yeah. But it's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> yeah. And who has the, uh, the security uh, rights to edit? and delete or backdate. Yeah. I mean, we could go into a whole bunch of that, but right. so if you have questions about that, perhaps you need the ask the expert <laughs> service that I offer yeah. Yeah. so that we can exactly. talk about that. Well, what else? And I just, I also just want to say that whole payment types thing is so important. You know, too often I'll look at a P and L and they only have patient revenue mm -hmm. and maybe refunds yeah. and, it's like, no, you really need to split out what you're getting from credit cards, what you're getting if you have a loyalty program with your patients, what you're getting from that. That's all. It's a different kind of revenue. And all of that needs to be um, detailed, managed, right? detailed. Yeah, I can actually look at the credit card deposits on a P&L and look in, at the merchant card fees under service fees and see if they're paying too much. I mean, you just do a quick, it's quick math, math calc in your head and go, yeah, this kind of looks like a lot. You know, maybe you should explore uh, reducing the credit card fees by calling them or calling others <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. There, there are people that specialize in yes, that. Yes, there are. You know, so. But it's like, yeah. you know, just having that. And then when you do an EFT insurance deposit, I mean, you can compare that with the practice software, but I see a lot of them putting EFT in with insurance or insurance payments in with patient pay, patient checks. Um, and I see on the QuickBooks side, patient refunds just being put into that same category of revenue. And yeah, you can't. A refund is not revenue. No, it's not. But it's how it used to be old accounting, you know, right. the, the one column and you would just do it that way. And, but for a two, this is the difference. It's a two accounting system. Mm -hmm. You've got the practice software in QuickBooks and that's why, because it's done in a different software. And so it needs to be separate so you can account for it. Otherwise you can balance those. Yeah. Two, right. Yeah. From a fraud standpoint, you definitely want that. Right, right. And it's just gotten more and more complex. And so I guess, you know, I hope that this podcast, this discussion will give the listeners something to think about, to go back and, um, you know, look at their own reports and see if if they have questions or concerns about them. Yeah, and, and I want to remind the listeners, I actually wrote a chapter in the Money In, Money Out book on working with the CPA. And so there's a lot of information in there and, and a lot of what we talked about. But the reason that we wanted to talk about it was because of what all three of us have seen this year in the horrific accounting um, that has come across our desk um, and really unnecessary. So right. it, I, I always, y'all I think this is funny. I, it pisses me off. Let's just be honest. It pisses me off that they've been charged 
an exorbitant amount of money and do for nothing, for nothing and don't have the reports that they've needed. Mm -hmm. um, and I always apologize. I'm not even a CPA, but I find myself apologizing for that industry uh, mm -hmm. because they, they lump us all in together, mm -hmm. but um, it's uncalled for. And so if, if you are a listener and you're, uh, we've raised a lot of questions, um, call me and we'll, we'll talk about it or call Jody and Linda and they can point you in the right direction or help you. Yep. Anything That's else it. that we need to talk about gals? No, we'll just tell them to call you, Susan, anyway. <laughs> so, they should call yes. you. Yeah, the whole reason we ended up on this podcast is because three of the four accounts that yeah. you've had cons your major concerns about were people that we saw. And, you know, it, it can happen to you. And you shouldn't feel bad if you are a dentist out there. Mm -hmm. You are skilled at doing dentistry. Right. Exactly. You don't know what. You don't know what a CPA is supposed to do, nor should you. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, if it's not, if it, something isn't setting right with you, then you need to act on that intuition and make a phone call. Um, it's mm -hmm. it, it, This side of your business does not have to be as hard as it seems to be made for some, um, some people. Yeah. And a... You know, like Susan said, for Linda and I and for Susan, you know, we'll see the money that gets spent. And it's crazy. Yeah. It, you should not be spending $2,000 a month for reports you don't know what they mean or you don't feel value from them. So you need to find a way to help somebody help you understand your business. No kidding. You mean it doesn't heal itself? <laughs> Just like dentistry yeah. doesn't go away. No, it doesn't. <laughs> this, this doesn't go away either. Well, any final words? That was Jody's, I think. Linda? That was my yeah. final word. And I just think, you know, that it's, it's co complex times that we are practicing in and don't feel... Um, overwhelmed, don't feel embarrassed, don't feel um, taken advantage of, I guess. You know, just if something doesn't look right, doesn't feel right, make some phone calls and ask some questions. Uh, because there are there are people out there that know how to look at these things and to give you solid advice and get things straightened out. So it's, um, so it's a lot easier and you can sleep much easier at night because of it. Yeah, and it's never too late to get a scope of work or an engagement letter done. I mean, my CPA mm -hmm. sends me one at the end of every year for the following year. Mm -hmm. And so I get one. And so you need to have one. It's not too late. Call and ask about getting one. Yeah. So, oh, my gosh, I always have so much fun with you guys when you join me. <laughs> it's it's fun anyway. I mean, the three of us, it's yeah. like we never have a dull moment anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but thank you so much for providing all this valuable information to the listening audience. Mm -hmm. For more information about your services, what is the best way for them to get hold of you? I think uh, email at Linda at Mosaic Management Group dot com or Jody, J-O-D-Y at Mosaic Management Group dot com. Or your um, website. Our website, Mosaic Management Group dot com. Um, and then if they want to call 248-792-2700. That's awesome. You guys, thank you. Thank you for your trust in the referrals um, as well. But thank you for joining me today to talk about what has been really important. If this past year has taught professional practices anything, it is that you not only need to access your financial reports in a timely manner, but you need to understand those financial reports. I am sure there are listeners that are wondering what an extreme makeover would look like for their practices, QuickBooks. Just pick up the phone, call me, let's talk. It doesn't mean you're committing to do it, just means you're starting. 
And because there are listeners, by the way, that know what an extreme makeover did for their organization and understanding of their financial reports, and the change is phenomenal, I know that they are, they're out there, as well as those listeners that have done an Ask the Expert to learn how to have back-to-back -back accountability between all the software to help protect their finances. Um, they've been happy. I don't think I've ever had anyone from those two services that were not thrilled at the results. In the extreme makeover, as I talked about, I rearranged the existing chart of accounts to the practice management chart of accounts, which is designed to go beyond the tax accounting that we talked about to managing the business of your practice. I also create reports for you and memorize them to be reviewed on a weekly and a monthly basis. I, tr I respect your time as business owners and try to make it as easy as possible. I clean up the multiple account messes that we also talked about and make notes for questions and explanations. Then I meet with you to walk through your fresh and cleaned QuickBooks. And I handhold as long as you need me. But my goal, my goal in all of it is not for you to become dependent on me. My goal in all of it is to empower you as a business owner, period. So let me help you, please. There's no excuse to continue to not understand the business of your practice. The time is now. Call me and let's talk about what bothers you the most and how I can help. I cannot help if you do not call. <laughs> this reminds me of the doctor that finally called me last year. And I say finally, because she told me she had a sticky note on her computer for months to call me and finally did when the pandemic hit. I literally showed her how to clean up her QuickBooks and showed her how QuickBooks actually should be used effectively. It was awesome. So thank you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Remember, I'm here to help you and to serve you. And I am very client driven. So please call me to help. Thanks for listening in. Next time it will be an In the Embezzlement News with Janice Jansen. We're excited to bring you some more embezzlement information. Uh, that always gets really great list, listening ship. I'm sure this one will too, because I'm putting CPA in it, it's the title. So we're gonna have we're gonna have a lot of listeners on this one. Anyways, thank you guys for listening in. And again, there are great CPAs out there. You just need to find them. And if you're not satisfied with yours, then you need to talk to them and communicate. Maybe it's just a communication problem. Okay, until next time, take care. That's a wrap for this podcast of Money In, Money Out. Thanks for listening. Be sure to write down the most valuable tip you learned today so you don't forget it. And remember, you can find out more about all the valuable books and services Susan has to offer at www.susangunsolutions.com.